Jannatul Baqi was destroyed. 8 Shawwal 1344. Two years and almost two months are remained. 400 years uh, for this uh, tragedy. Jannat al-Baqi is one of the oldest and largest cemeteries in Saudi Arabia, Medina. It is the burial place of over 10,000 companions of the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, as well as his family and companions. It literally means of a heavenly tree garden. Jannat al-Baqi is widely regarded as one of the holiest places um, in Shia Islam, and it is the burial place of four of our Imams. It used to have beautiful golden domes, marble stone, markings as to who is buried in what place. It used to be a visitation place for many pilgrims to come and uh, perform ziyara of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his companions. It's living evidence, even though it's a graveyard, it's living evidence of uh, the Islamic faith Jannat al-Baqi is one of the oldest and largest cemeteries in Medina. It is the burial place of thousands of companions of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, as well as members of his family. Way back before uh, the Prophet actually migrated to Medina, right? Uh, Jannat al-Baqi was just a huge garden of trees, to be more specific, uh, of box on trees. After uh, Prophet uh, migrated over to uh, Medina, that's when uh, it got converted into a burial ground. It is the oldest Islamic uh, cemetery. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu when he migrated to Medina, he himself selected this uh, piece of land uh, for the graves of Muslims at the time. Until now, it is considered as very sacred place for a burial for Muslims. Very important personalities of Islamic history are buried there, including uh, the family of the Prophet Imam Hassan السلام, who is uh, the son of Rasulullah according to Quran, and Imam uh, Zainul Abidin السلام, Imam Muhammad Baqir السلام, Imam Jafar al-Sadiq These great personalities are buried there. Thousands, I can say, thousands of Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are buried in this cemetery. We have the uh, mother of Abdul Fazl Abbas, uh, Lady Mulbanin. Uh, she's buried over there too. And the uncle of uh, Imam Ali Alayhi Salam and Prophet Muhammad, uh, Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, he's buried over there too. We had the Abbasid, uh, Abbasids, uh, the empire, as well as the Ottoman Empire. They actually went ahead and uh, started bringing Jannat al-Baqi to glory, wherein they created mausoleums out there, wherein people can go ahead and uh, pray. The empire during that time, they actually did not have much of a distinguishing between uh, Mecca uh, and Mecca to be more specific, Kaaba, uh, as well as Jannat al-Baqi. They were uh, treating them both uh, the same. Uh, the fees are, you know how we have to pay certain fee right now to go to Kaaba, right? They had something similar at that time too. They had the exact same fee listed for uh, people to go ahead and visit um, uh, Jalant al -Bakhi. So the so for the pilgrimage, right? They had the exact same uh, levels at that time. Muhammad ibn al Saud and Muhammad ibn al Wahhab combined and began the Wahhabi ideology. They then set out to destroy shrines in the region due to their belief that Muslims who visited the shrines and performed prayers there was a form of polytheism. They formed a big army and initially went to Karbala in Iraq, destroying and sacking the shrines of Imam Hussein and Hazrat Abbas. Thereafter, they went to Mecca and destroyed another historical graveyard known as Jannat al Mu'alla. The Saudi Arabian regime. Um, with its allies to gain power, they sided with Ibn Taymiyyah and his group uh, to gain legitimacy, and they 
formed a power structure around that. Once they formed that power structure, uh, the Wahhabi thought kind of spread its tentacles. And within the Wahhabi thought is the destruction of holy sites um, at a baseline level. From a historical point of view, they were uh, outside the uh, Medina area for a good 14 to 16 months. Uh, and then finally, they fought with the Ottomans at that time, and then they uh, demolished the, uh, the mausoleums and everything, shrines that were built in Jannat al -Bakhi. So that was the first destruction. Um, this caused uh, a huge uproar uh, from the Muslim communi uh, community at that time. Uh, eventually, after a six to eight uh, year war, the Ottomans uh, gained once uh, again control over, they defeated the Wahhabis and they gained control over the Makkah, uh, Medina region. And then they started rebuilding the uh, shrines over, over the duration. Though the Wahhabi coalition was forced out of the region, history repeated itself once again in 1926. The Wahhabis came out with a fatwa that we actually need to go ahead and uh, destroy these mausoleums again. Uh, and it was destroyed uh, once again. Oh, and this happened overnight, where uh, a lot of people did not even know who were living in Saudi and in Medina, right? You had a lot of Shias at that time. They actually did not know that this was going to happen. They destroyed all the shrines of the Natal Baqiyah. All of them were raised to ground. The destruction of Jannat al-Baqi sparked uproar and protests across the Muslim world. The effects of the demolition of this holy graveyard can be felt until today. Whenever there is a kind of destruction of a building, the built environment has this kind of, you know, attachment to a single group of people. And that uh, in turn has an attachment to the cultural identity. And so I think by destroying uh, the architecture, they you know, wanted to destroy the cultural identity and the uh, heritage that came along with that. Building a uh, mausoleum on uh, any grave is shirk according to them, which is, is a really strange ideology uh, to Islamic uh, world. Why? Because Muslims for centuries uh, would go and visit uh, these places and, the, uh, and, and these shrines were there for centuries. Scholars, uh, great scholars would go and visit. Uh, of course, uh, it, it was to follow the uh, uh, Sirat of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself. He would go and visit the, the graves. We have in history, we have riwayat that he would go and visit the uh, the graves. For someone or for an organization to go ahead and destroy a place where anybody is buried, they have to see that place as a threat to their well-being, to their power, to whatever it is they're trying to protect. So when it comes to the Wahhabi ideology and those behind the movement, I truly believe that when they see the Shia believers who follow the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and the family, come to Jand al-Baqi and you know, pay their respects, send their salams, it is a threat to them. And the presence of a dome over, for example, Imam al Hassan al Islam is a threat to them because it's a remembrance of what happened and it's a, a symbol of the strength of the Shia. And I truly believe the, the reason they went to destroy it was to destroy it, was, was to further break down the Shia and, and destroy that symbol of strength. Based out of Chicago, Illinois, one of the organizations at the forefront of the struggle to rebuild Bucky is the international movement known as the al Bucky Organization. The organization seeks to raise awareness of the demolition and calls for its rebuilding. This organization actually was started in 2003. We started here uh, with some protests and demonstrations locally in Chicago. Then uh, we decided to go to Washington, D.C. And we started doing that. And mashallah, uh, since then until now, every year we go to Washington, D.C. and, and protest in front of uh, uh, Saudi embassy. And then after that, we will go to, uh, you know, um, uh, White House and do the protest, uh, in, you know, in front of White House, uh, asking our government 
to disassociate with such a government, with uh, such uh, a regime that is uh, uh, on the top of human rights violations. We had uh, the attack on the shrines of, uh, in Iraq to be more specific, Samara, wherein the uh, shrine was destroyed over there. We had bombings out there, and this happened multiple times, but uh, that, that actually caused an outcry. And uh, the group actually came in as, hey, we had Janatul Bahi uh, destroyed. We cannot have this happen again. So that's where it's like, hey, not only do we need to raise awareness, uh, we also need to go ahead and preserve what we currently have and start to rebuild. The motivation was to spread the word, um, to protest against the atrocities that the Saudi Arabian regime has been committing and highlight uh, General Tobaki and the destruction of General Tobaki. This goal um, expanded from a protest in Chicago and then led to protests in Washington, D.C. That was the main sort of event uh, that Al Baki organization held. Yes, Jannah Al Baki is a graveyard on its surface, but it goes far, far above that, where it's hope, it's the Islamic faith, and it shows the graveyards of, of other faiths as well and their heritage sites. Rebuild Bucky organization has always worked to make sure that, it, yes, it happened to us and it shouldn't happen to anyone else. It's not just what happened uh, with the demolition and the destruction, but um, what's ongoing in the current kind of political climate, right? There is uh, human rights violations being done and women injustices um, that's prevalent today as we speak. So um, to kind of bring to light that and also um, for the future, you know, ultimately the goal of the organization is the reconstruction of genital Bucky. We actually have protests going all over on the HFL from Australia, various uh, cities in, uh, in India, uh, various cities in the US, uh, Canada, England. So there, there are protests going all around. I myself am from Chicago. So when it started, um, you know, we all kind of knew about it. And this issue was widespread in Chicago. But interestingly enough, um, around the nation and around the world, this issue, even amongst Shias, was not very well known. Um, and I think the al Baki organization has had a hand in at least making this a widespread issue for Shias around the world. And then also advocating at the highest levels to rebuild Jannah al Baki and stop the atrocities and the religious heritage destruction, not only of Saudi Arabia, but as ISIS came to the forefront um, in the late 2000s, speaking out against them because it seems like the mainstream media wants to lump Muslims all into one group and making sure that we are saying that ISIS does not represent our values and our beliefs is very important. One of the core movements of the organization are the protests that take place on the anniversary of the destruction of Jannah al-Baqi worldwide. However, some may ask, what is the importance of protesting? And does it actually have a tangible impact? It was a Harvard study. Uh, a Harvard study cited just recently about how protesting is extremely effective. But it wasn't, they didn't look at political effectiveness, like, you know, how many, um, the results that it yielded, but rather the study looked at engagement. They saw that, that protesting was the highest effective um, means of awareness amongst people and that's so important with the Bucky organization because not only are we protesting for change but we're building a community along the way and we're gaining activism and we're spreading knowledge along the way. In my mind it effectuates a lot of change because it started off in Chicago with not even a hundred people with signs that were made you know with markers and posters and now it's a, a couple thousand people Within the span of 10 years, we have increased um, from just the Chicago community coming to communities chartering buses up and down the East Coast and around the nation uh, to come to this protest. The power of an organized movement 
that seeks justice. There, there's so much power in that. A hadith comes to my mind, Imam Ali alayhi salam, he says, O oh human being, do not think that you are small or insignificant because within you is the entire universe. And I feel like that's so important when it comes to protesting because it doesn't matter if you are a woman or you're a youth or you're an elder, you might think, you know, who am I to go out and protest? But within you is everything you possess to stand up. And within you, Rasalat is, is there, within you Tawheed is there, within you Alu Bayt is there and because Alu Bayt is there, you have a responsibility towards them. You have that responsibility to go out and stand up for those who are oppressing them. And when you look at protesting, just in 2020, take a look, there were so many protests. For example, when George Floyd was killed, people recognized when injustice is being done and no matter what the religion, it is the fitra of the human being to stand up for justice. And that is why protesting is so important because it really, it, it channels that inner, in, inner fitra that Allah SWT has placed there and that want for justice. Even if it effectuates nothing, we have always seen it as a duty of ours. And given that we are the followers of the Ahlul Bayt, uh, we take example from our Imams and in particular Imam Hussein, who could, you could say the same thing that he had only 72 followers against an tyrant army of 30,000. Why stand up? But he stood up. Um, and even if his voice was small at that time and he did not have many people, it was impactful. And he, he, he gave us the lesson to make sure that your voice is heard, even if it is small. Aside from organizing protests, the Al-Baqi organization has also made significant steps towards practical change, both in rebuilding the Holy Graveyard and in holding Saudi Arabia accountable for their actions. We try to actually raise awareness, not just within uh, the uh, Shia population or the uh, Shia uh, sect uh, within Muslims. Uh, we actually tackle uh, different areas uh, and different groups of folks. So we. We, uh, we actually go out to various conventions. We have the mock up uh, that we uh, put up in Karbala. Uh, we have folks uh, going around all over the world, uh, visiting different um, Imam Bargas or uh, masajids out there. Uh, for example, some of our folks even went to uh, uh, Philippines out there as well as South Africa. We do the typical protests uh, so that the uh, government in each nation knows about it. We also go ahead and work with various uh, governments uh, across all over the world. Bucky organization has had an impact on a national and an international level. Now there are chapters of Al Bucky around the nation uh, where there weren't before. There are protests held around the nation. The Bucky message has been expanded internationally um, to places like Iraq and India and Pakistan. We have had political campaigns within India uh, to start petitions to get the Indian government to raise its voice. In the United States, we are working with administration um, with, the pre with the federal and state administrations to raise a voice and raise this message. And on top of that, we have done a lot of advocacy at the international level, um, at the UN, and have been recognized by the UN as an NGO with special consultative status, which is a very, very big deal. That gives Al-Baqi a say, um, at least a seat at the table, when it comes to human rights reviews. Um, and inshallah, within the coming years, Saudi Arabia is actually due to um, have its human rights review done or completed. And al Baki organization will have a seat at the table at that. So that is a very, very big accomplishment, alhamdulillah. It is clear that the Shia world collectively protests the destruction of this holy site. However, the question arises, is this an issue specific to Shia Muslim sentiments or does it affect non-Shia as well? 
the distinguished leaders that are born um, in Jannat al baqi are the pro mostly Prophet Muhammad and his children, right? He has a son there, he has his daughter, um, and his grandchildren there. And these these distinguished leaders do not just are not limited to just the Shia faith. They are role models for all Muslims alike, and that's why they should be treated as such. It's sad to see that you know these these people couldn't be brought down during their lifetime so much that they had to be brought down in their grave, and that's why we're saying that we simply cannot stand for that. And it's time that you know they stood for us for so many years, and they made sure that we have the religion we love. So it's time that you know we take a stand for them. The issue of the destruction of Jannah Tobaki is a symbol in my mind. It is one example of the destruction of religious heritage. And when you allow that to happen, if you stand complicit in that, it gives power and legitimacy to those authorities, to those authoritarian regimes that are doing that work. Um, that are committing those atrocities. By standing up against this, you stand up against the other ones as well. For example, ISIS, when they were going through Iraq, um, they destroyed a lot of Christian holy sites. Um, and they got their legitimacy because they have this one example of Jannat al-Baqi. So it is an example that we should take that should affect non-Muslims and ha already has. We've already seen those atrocities carried out. And Baki stands not only for Jannah to Baki and the destruction of Jannah to Baki, but also the destruction of all religious heritage, whatever faith it is uh, relevant to. When we started this mission, from very uh, beginning, we never said that this, this is uh, a um, and you know, this is an issue that belongs to a particular sect. This issue is a human rights issue, first of all. It belongs to all humans who uh, respect humans. And um, uh, we are talking about people who are buried there, who were uh, the leaders in all fields of science and knowledge. Imam Jafar al-Sadiq Imam Muhammad Baqir and all other. So it is respect to knowledge, respect to, to humanity. You know, in this country, many times this happened that some people vandalized uh, some cemeteries, Jew cemetery and any other cemetery. All people, including us Muslims, we condemned that. We said, this is wrong. Nobody has the right to disrespect anybody's, uh, you know, um, you know, cemeteries or graveyard or place of uh, um, burial. So this is something that belongs to all humanity. When we, when we talk about it, that's why in, in our protest, Christians, um, Hindus, Jews, uh, and uh, even those who believe in no religion, they attend. Uh, you know, beside the Muslims, Shia and Sunni both. So this is uh, a, a something that belongs to a human issue, not a sectarian or a, a just only a religious issue. The preservation of heritage really gives us our history and the importance of our history. If we are to ignore the structures that make up part of our faith, then our children, our grandchildren, they won't know uh, what what are the important what are the important pieces of our faith. To create a structure at Jannah Tobaki shows the importance of Bibi Fatima and the Imams that are buried there. And to destroy that and allow for the destroying of that and to be complicit in that destruction uh, shows that we don't give it much importance. But it is our heritage and it shows why the Imams that are buried there are important and thus it is important to speak out against it. The preservation of heritage essentially is the preservation of Islam. Because if you think about it, where does the love for the Prophet and his family get planted? It gets planted in the heart and the only way that can grow is when you know your history, when you understand 
what happened to the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his family? What, what were those personalities like? Why do we revere them so much in Islam? That's how that love grows. So the preservation of these holy sites in Jalal al-Baqi is very important because, you know, inshallah, one day I want to take my son, my daughter to visit Jalal al-Baqi and be able to show them this is where your Imams are buried. These are where your, you know, your Prophet's companions are buried. Looking at it in an architectural lens, when you destroy architecture, right, that's actually destroying the cultural identity of a, of a specific uh, people that's attributed to it. It's not just material. There's this kind of attachment to it uh, spiritually, mentally, and culturally um, a group is kind of um, attached, right? And when you attack that, it's removing the symbolism, right, that's attached to it. So um, it's actually a destruction of justice and it goes against human rights. My parents used to take me to these uh, majalis uh, throughout the year, obviously. All of the majalis, right, would be associated with uh, someone's shahadat out there, right? It's either uh, the 10th of Muharram, the Ikkis Ramzan, 21st of Ramadan, uh, for Ma Imam Ali alayhi salam's shahadat. Uh, so you had all these uh, days wherein you would be going uh, to majalis wherein you are um, you are basically uh, reciting the majlis for the martyrdom. Uh, however, there, there used to be this majlis, which was very, it's, it kind of stuck to me because we used to go to this and it was like the, in Urdu it's called Inhidam uh, Jannat al Bakhi. So it's, it used to be on H Shawal obviously, but wherein we used to go ahead and uh, read a majlis, uh, read Basayab out there uh, about th this place wherein that how it got destroyed and I was like, this is this is weird. Why are we going ahead and uh, weeping and talking about a place that was destroyed? I was a kid at that time, but as I grew old, right, I was like, wow. So that that was my first recollection, and it stuck, still stuck to me uh, from a personal point of view as to why uh, this is the uh, case. And obviously, like I mentioned earlier, we have one third of our imams out there. There is there is. Uh, the other places that we have, like Kadmain and Samara, right? We have two, two, two of each imams over there, but this is the place wherein we have four of our imams. We so it it holds an extremely high um, place in my heart. I've always seen that my grandparents weren't able to see Jannatul Baki perform to its former glory. My parents haven't been able to see it, and I wouldn't like to add on to that trend. Right, I don't want to fear the day that I have to show a picture of Jannatul Baki and say, oh, this is this used to be a graveyard. And if someone asks me and say, what happened to it now? I can't, I don't want to be the one that says it doesn't exist anymore. Beside that, that I'm a Muslim, I'm coming here as a, a, a Muslim who loves the Prophet and loves his family and loves his um, companions. Um, so I'm here. For that reason, besides that, that I am one of the descendants of Imam Zain al-Abidin, the fourth Imam who is buried here. So I have the right to come and visit my grandfather's grave and you have no right to stop me. That is where our Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, used to visit. And that is where Imam Mahdi alayhi salam goes to visit. And when I think of Imam Mahdi and like, and how he goes to visit Jant al-Baqi and there are no graves, there are no markings, you can't tell who is buried where. And perhaps he looks to Karbala and he says, look at my grandfather, Imam al Hussein, the visitors who are coming to him, the domes that are over his, his grave. Yet look at my grandfather, Imam al-Hassan, on the other side with not even a marking on his grave. And, and this breaks your heart. We have the smaller goals uh, as well as the long-term goals, right? We want to see something tangible uh, that can happen uh, quickly. Our initial demands are, let's please allow uh, us to go ahead and uh, recite prayers over there and also allow our uh, sisters, mothers and sisters, so that they can go uh, perform their uh, prayers, go inside Jantal Bakhi, and then they can uh, do those. So these, these are small steps that we want to take. From a longer term point of view, 
uh, we want to see uh, Jannat al Bakhi being rebuilt. We're fighting really hard for this to happen, and oh, inshallah, it should be the last time we have to fight this hard for it because it's such a basic religious freedom. It's such a basic human right to be able to have an institution that you can look towards and an institution that you can commemorate. Um, and when that's being taken down by a government that isn't even your own government, it's some government that's in charge of it that doesn't believe with those ideals. It shouldn't have that should not have to be a problem. That's why we need to work towards instigating that human rights change and that freedom, not only for our heritage sites, but other heritage sites that are being taken down by authoritarian governments as well. I would like to see Jannat al Baki resemble its name. So it's a tree garden of heaven. Um, and right now it's in complete rubble and just barren land. Um, I want to see the opposite of that, you know, um, just remnants of maybe the Ottoman uh, architecture with its domes and semi-spherical um, uh, kubbas. Uh, and also just uh, some of the important characteristics for me are light. You know, um, right now the, the space is so dark and we, we must light it with just and make it as bright as possible um, so that if there is, you know, a shrine or mausoleum when there is one over there, it's um, lighted for the believers and, and visitors. More importantly, signage, you know, um, right now they've taken away and stripped away any identification, any sort of um, signage there. We don't know who's buried where. And I would like to see it, you know, in a beautiful hand calligraphic maybe way of identifying the holy personalities buried there. If we can at least put that structure there, but on a broader level um, to make sure that the tyrant of the day is being called out for his crimes and help those other people who are being oppressed fight oppression. As we approach the 100 year anniversary of the destruction of Jannat al-Baqi, the Baqi organization, like so many across the globe, continuously calls for the reconstruction of this blessed and important graveyard. And whatever the outcome, the Saudi government can be assured that our voices of protest will continue until it's rebuilt.